Ladies and gentlemen, as promised to you last episode, today we build a light gun. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Well, first and foremost, here it is. As you can see, it's extremely high tech, you know, with the toilet roll and everything. So yeah, it basically looks as bare bones as, you know, an Arduino project typically looks. Now, of course, before we even begin doing anything, I think it's quite important to say that this isn't perfect, far from it, in fact. There are several glaring issues. First and foremost, I'm actually not using the best kind of light sensor. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but the idea is this light sensor actually has a little bit of a slow reaction time, and that's why we can't get you know, our animation to go very fast on screen. Secondly, because I really wanted to use web programming technology to, well, show my little game, that makes the whole architecture a little bit on the complex and messy side. Again, I'll elaborate more later on, but yeah, the point is, this isn't sort of the prettiest or the best way to do it, it's more like a little proof of concept, so do bear that in mind, right? Don't take this as sort of a golden standard for doing anything by any stretch of the imagination. Anyway, with that said, let us go ahead and delve into the overall architecture itself. We of course start with our hardware. And what this really represents is, firstly of course, our Arduino itself. This is connected to our light sensor, as well as a hardware push button. This is then connected to the computer via USB. And this communicates using a serial connection. So this is where things get a little bit messy the serial connection actually goes towards a Node.js server. This server then forwards the information via WebSockets to our front end, which is a web page. Now, I know this sounds kind of unnecessary, but well, as mentioned, we need this for our web front end because obviously the web front end itself cannot touch the serial connection. We'll keep our server very simple. In fact, you can think of it as just, you know, a middleman that is passing all the messages through between the two. So in normal use, here's how things are going to work. Firstly, when you press the button on the light gun itself, it actually sends a message to your client, which is just a trigger message. This tells your client to get ready. What's going to happen is the client is going to start to show the actual animation, you know, the highlighting between the black and white boxes. It will show the first one of the lots before actually pinging the hardware. It will then wait for the hardware to go ahead and get a sensor reading, which is passed back to it. It then keeps track you know, of the actual value being read back from the sensor, before then showing the next frame and repeating the entire process over. This as you can imagine repeats several times until we get enough readings for every target on screen. That is the general architecture and the sort of general way in which our program will operate. So yeah, that's the general idea. We will be spending time on each one of these parts, but I think the biggest emphasis actually goes, well, towards the software part at the end. Not to worry if I gloss over certain things too quickly, all the code will be available for download, and well, if it isn't, you know, I've probably forgotten, just send me a comment, I will go ahead and put it up. Anyway, with that said, let us go ahead and take a look at the hardware. Now, this part is very simple because really, we are just doing two things with the hardware. Firstly, we of course want to connect to the light sensor. This is important because, well, it's kind of the main thing that does its job. But I've also added a little push button to the mix. All we're doing here is to use that button to actually trigger, you know, like pressing that trigger on your light gun itself. Clearly, this is kind of on the optional side, but I guess it sort of completes the whole hardware picture. To build along with this, you will need an Arduino microcontroller. Technically, any microcontroller will do, but well, the code I've written here is for the Arduino platform. I use the breadboard to, you know, link everything together. If you want to do something that looks more permanent with 100% less toilet roll, you might want to, you know, use a different way of hooking things up. Here's what our hardware connection looks like. As you can see, it's extremely simple. Our trigger button goes towards the analog zero input on the Arduino itself. I mean, technically it doesn't need analog, but well, the pin is on the closer side, so I just use that. Then of course, we have the photoresistor itself, which does actually need analog input. That goes towards the A1 pin. Again, don't forget your resistors. 
In fact, once we have that, that's the entirety of the hardware setup. The code itself is also pretty simple. We are basically only doing two main things. Firstly, when a button is pressed, send the word trigger in via the serial port. Then basically listen on the serial port. Then anytime you actually receive anything at all on the serial port, simply just send back the reading from the light sensor. So it's as simple as that. We're not doing any computation at all using the Arduino. It's just sort of a message passing tool. All right, with that, we can move on to our Node.js server. Again, this guy just acts as a message passing tool. Basically, it needs to do two things. It needs to maintain a serial connection, you know, to talk to the Arduino, as well as to maintain a WebSocket connection, which talks to our front end. It talks to our game. Whenever any messages at all are received via serial, so that can be a trigger command, that can be a reading, you know, from the light sensor, it is just passed verbatim to its clients, which are of course just copies of the game that have, well, connected to that server. At the same time, if a client actually tries to send any messages back at all, well, in fact, we force it to say ping, right? We force it to actually, well, ping the Arduino itself, and that would trigger the returning of a reading. So that's the idea, right? We're not gonna spend too much time here. Just think of your server as a message pass-through that connects your hardware with your browser itself. And this allows us to move on to the client, which does three things, really. Firstly, it needs to actually maintain the WebSocket connection. Secondly, it needs to maintain the game state. And thirdly, which is also the most important, it needs to handle the light gun logic. It needs to actually respond to your trigger and it needs to, well, basically go through the whole highlighting targets thing. So let's take a look at how all these three things basically sort of hang and mesh together. Starting with the game logic itself, because, well, this is sort of the simplest part and also serves as the driving force behind everything. So basically what we have is a large HTML5 canvas that fills the screen. Uh, we populate it with several targets. In my case, I'm using five. Each one of them actually possesses several pieces of information, namely the image itself, as well as its position and velocity. We constantly update the animation by calling the request animation frame function, which is available in JavaScript. The way this works is we write a function that basically advances the animation one step forwards, and we pass it along to request animation frame, which keeps calling this function as much as possible. This is what enables us to have smooth animation. But what does our logic do per frame? Well, here's what it does. First, it checks a variable to see if polling is active. In this case, I've used the term polling to mean, you know, when the light gun is actually sort of making its test to see what you're hitting. So we'll call that polling. And if it's not active, then we simply move the game state forward. And this basically forms sort of, you know, the normal condition of the game as the game is being played. However, if polling is active, then we need to check something else, and that is whether a piece of new data has come in from the sensor. If it hasn't, we just wait. But if it has, then we'll actually have to sort of think about how we want to move the state forward and record the new data that has come back to us. So this basically forms the basis of how the entire program works over time. Let's now delve a little bit deeper into what these two variables mean. To understand this, we're going to have to look at the other side of the story, and that is the code that actually handles the messaging on the socket. Here's the deal. Really, we can only receive two types of messages. The first one is a trigger, and what this means is we want to actually start the whole polling process. Of course, if that's the case, we simply need to set the polling as active variable to true. With the rest of our code in place that we've seen earlier, this will kickstart the entire polling process. As the polling is ongoing, the other type of message can be received, and that is a numerical value. So basically, at this point, we don't really handle this data, we just sort of pass it along to another variable, and then we set this flag to true, so that our code later on knows that a new piece of data has come back. So hopefully, this is a good demonstration of how everything hangs together. We need to do things this way because, well, our game logic runs frequently. This is basically animation logic, so it happens many times per second. 
Our socket handler on the other hand fires quite rarely. It only runs when a new message comes in from the hardware. So that's why we have to sort of jump through these hoops and have some in-between variables to help us pass messages between these two pieces of logic, which sort of run at very different rates, so they cannot directly talk to each other. So yeah, for these two things to communicate properly, we have these four variables, and we can actually see them being set up in our socket function. Basically, the code in here runs whenever we receive a message from the socket, and yeah, as you can see, on trigger, what we're doing is we're setting up all four of these variables. Of course, if we do receive a message that is not the trigger, then it must be an integer, which is, well, the sensor reading. Now, out of all these variables, we haven't discussed one of them, and that would be the polling index. This variable is very interesting because it serves to tell us sort of which stage of the polling we are in. As you can see at the very beginning, we have initialized the polling index to negative 3. What this means is to actually initialize the entire polling process. The code is fairly simple. We start by simply turning the whole screen black. Then we set the polling index to negative 2. After that, we basically ping the hardware. And what this means is we are asking the hardware to send back a sensor reading. When we actually get the sensor reading back, it should tell us what black looks like. So you can think of this as sort of a calibration step. We now know the sensor reading, you know, the numerical value known as the black level that corresponds to, well, when the sensor is looking at black color. Since now that we know that, we have to test the other thing, which of course is the white level. So we turn the screen white, and again, we ping the hardware. The next value that comes back is of course the white level. Notice that over these couple of states, the polling index has been changing, and that sort of tells us what kind of number to expect when, you know, a new value comes back. Once we have the black and white levels, we can now begin to query each individual item on screen. So yeah, now the polling index actually represents you know, the index of the item in our game array. Basically, we simply pull out, you know, whichever item it is based on the polling index. Since we know it's width and height, we can simply draw a white square over the object. Once we've done that, again, we do another ping, right? We try to get back another value from the sensor. Once we have safely recorded that value, we can then update the screen to highlight the next item. And this process repeats. Basically, we just keep highlighting each item, taking note of the brightness value as that item is highlighted, and then going on to the next item. So yeah, basically we keep repeating this until every single item has been highlighted. When that happens, we then call another function to handle the results, and we stop the entire looping process. As you can imagine, the results are a set of numbers that maybe look something like this. Clearly, the first two numbers are very important to us because they indicate the black and white levels. They tell us what black looks like, what white looks like, and as a result, we can use that to make some inferences about the rest of the values. Of course, in this case, after the black and white levels, the first number represents the brightness we detect when item number 0 has been highlighted. As you can see, this is a fairly low value quite similar to our black level. As a result, we can infer that, well, the sensor wasn't pointed at that item. Same deal for the next item, our sensor was probably not pointed at that item either. However, when we move on to the very last item, well, we now have a very high brightness value. And what this means is, well, that's probably the target you are aiming at, so it gets deleted from the game. This entire logic, when you know expressed in code, is actually really simple. We're simply looping through our results array and checking, well, the brightness level that we've received back. And if it falls within a certain threshold, we simply remove that object from the gate. Of course, the tricky part is that, well, we have to decide where the threshold actually is. If you set it too low, you might get too many false positives. If you set it too high, you'll get too many false negatives. So yeah, you are going to have to pick a good value here so that that doesn't happen. Of course, other heuristics are in place as well. 
For example, I have one where if the white and black level are too close to each other, I reject the entire set of readings because then I wouldn't be certain of any of the values that I've actually gotten. That is essentially our entire light gun logic. And there you go, that has been our little toilet roll light gun project. And yeah, as you can see, it does its job, albeit not amazingly. As mentioned, we are using a photoresistor here, and it has a small delay associated with it, and that's why, well, our screen animation cannot go too fast. This is about as fast as I could push it, but if you're using something else like a photodiode, you may have better luck. Anyway, that's basically it. That's all there is for this episode. I hope you had fun because this was quite fun to build for me as well. I'm sorry it got a little bit complex, you know, with the whole client-server thing. But yeah, I just really like, you know, using the HTML canvas too much. Anyway, if you want to look at the code, I should have a link in the video description that goes to the NerdFirst website. So yeah, do check that out. Other than that, that's it. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.